All right, I believe that uh, I need to move my... Jesse says my clock is ticking really loud. So I... I'm going to get rid of it. That'll teach it. Sound better? <laughs> All right. Time for devotions. If you have a Bible, you're welcome to turn to Romans chapter 5. Tonight, uh, as we've been doing on Wednesdays, I just take a, a bit of your evening to go through a passage of scripture that I think is relevant for us and um, try and primarily speak to my church. I have no idea who's tuning in, uh, if we've attracted any other watchers over the last few weeks. But uh, for my church, uh, this may be cliche to some, but we're going to speak on God's love for us, which uh, ultimately is a theme that... I would ultimately say this, ultimately the theme, the theme of scripture, all the way from the beginning to the end, though uh, it doesn't consistently say, doesn't consistently use the words God loves us, or God loves you, or Jesus loves you, uh, at any rate, but we know that God does because of how scripture is laid out for us from the very beginning, when he gave us a beautiful world to live in and provided us with everything that we needed to be safe and healthy and happy. Uh, from the things we see with our eyes, to the food that we taste, to the things we experience. Everything was created to be good for us because God loves his creation and he loves us uh, as his image bearers. Uh, even through the event of the fall, God was there to provide Adam and Eve with a temporary covering of animal skin. Um, even his act of banishing them from the garden was an act of love because he did so in order for them to um, keep from eating the tree of life and locking themselves into their fallen state. Um, by permitting death, God has allowed us a way to uh, go into um, paradise and to escape the gra grip of sin. Uh, to everything. The flood is evidence of God's love for mankind, if you will look at it. The giving of the law is God's evidence for mankind, all the way to the arrival of his son, and every graphic detail of Christ's crucifixion speaks of God's love for us. The resurrection speaks of God's love for us. The church and his establishment of it, and all that the church is created to do in our life and with our life uh, to help us, that's evidence of God's love. The body of Christ being here still to serve us and to help us on through as we go through the book of Revelation on Sundays, uh, we are going to see glimpses of God's love. So even though the Bible doesn't always say God loves you, uh, though it does in many instances, the theme of scripture is that God loves us. And so uh, in Romans chapter 5, we're going to look at a passage that really does speak explicitly of God's love and how he demonstrated that. Uh, another passage is 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, that speaks of God's love, and it tells us that we love God because God first loved us. And so God's love was preemptive, and as a response to the love that we got from God, we then love God and other people. So when John says that we love God because God loved us first, it's implying that God loves us with an inspirational kind of love, that his love will have an effect on us, and the effect that it has will be one where we reciprocate the love we've been given. So if that's true, and God's love is inspirational, then um, our ability to love God relies on uh, his love for us. And, and then what happens um, is we really come to understand love um, by understanding God's um, perspective on you and I. Uh, what I mean by that is if our love, um, or I'm sorry, if God's love for, if we're deficient in our understanding of God's love for us, then where's that going to leave us in uh, life? If I don't believe God loves me, or I'm 
ignorant of it or I'm skeptical of it, then my ability to reciprocate love to God and to others is going to um, be very much affected by that because I can't be inspired by a love that I'm unaware of. And so um, we want to make sure that we're aware of God's love, not skeptical of it, not ignorant of it, but fully embracing of God's love for us so that we can then, as John says, love him and love others as we understand his love for us. So Romans chapter 5. Um, I think the passage would be in verse 5 through 11, uh, where it says, The love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So that's the passage that we'll be looking at here. And um, it is one in the New Testament that speaks very clearly about God's love for us. Uh, taking a close look at this passage, I hope, will... Um, edify the church. Uh, it will reinforce your understanding that God does indeed love you, that it will then embolden you in your faith and inspire you to a greater level of love. Um, I think it was to the Thessalonians, Paul said that uh, he was well aware of their love for one another and the, the love that they had for God and all, but then he encouraged them to grow more and more in that love. Um, if that wasn't Thessalonians, that was Paul's hope for all the churches, and that's the Holy Spirit's hope for us. So, looking at the passage we just read, <clears throat> we're told first that the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So, this is now speaking of a very personal love, not a corporate love, because we're well aware of the fact that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. World, that's a huge scope of of God's love being given to a wide um, demographic, the entire world. So we get that the world is loved by God. Uh, various passages tell us that Jesus died for all. So we know that Jesus loves everybody. Um, but we need to uh, understand that God's love for us is specific and individual too. While God loved the whole world and while Jesus died for all men, uh, it's also true that God loves the individual. And in, it's never better proven than when God gives you his Holy Spirit, because that's an individual act. God doesn't give his Holy Spirit to a race or a certain demographic. You don't need to be within a certain age bracket to receive the Holy Spirit. It's received upon faith in Christ, and he gives that to the individual. And so uh, we're being given a picture here of God's individual love, okay? So we're leaving the corporate and we're focusing on the uh, particular love that he gives to uh, each of us. So God gives the Holy Spirit as evidence of his love. And never does it uh, become more personal than when that Holy Spirit is given to you. He says, for when we were still without strength, uh, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, we know that Christ came into the world at a specific time, roughly 2,000 years ago, uh, to do the work that he did uh, on behalf of his righteous life and then his, uh, his death and resurrection. But also bringing this back to the individual um, work that God does in a specific person, this is uh, true of us as well, of you, I'll say, as well where uh, while you were without strength, Christ came at just the right time. 
for those of us that are born again, it often came at a point where we were grasping for air, so to speak, drowning in sin and suddenly aware of the fact that we were. Maybe up until then we had been living in ignorance or denial, thinking that we had a control over everything and, and everything was fine until one day we realized that that was not the case, that we were uh, fooling ourselves and everybody else. And it was at that point that we cried out for God. And the Bible here is telling us that that was when it happened, yes. God is agreeing with you. While we were without strength, that's when Christ came. Not only in due time, meaning 2,000 years ago, but also at the perfect time in your own life. So what that says to me is that God was paying attention to you even while you were ignoring him. He was watching you grow weaker and weaker as you struggled against your sin. Even while you were denying him, he was keeping close track of you. That speaks of his love for you before you were even aware of him or ready to acknowledge him or any such thing. So God loved you long before you even entered into a love relationship with him. So God was watching and seeing how you were growing weaker uh, the longer that you insisted on living without him. And so knowing where that would go, God determined the perfect time to rescue you. The perfect time. Be, and it, ha it had to be at the very time that it did happen in your life. Um, God's timing is always perfect. Uh, had he come into your life too soon, you would have pushed him away. Had he come just too late, uh, you'd be dead. A lot of us would have been already long gone. Um, God rescued us not just from spiritual death, but in many cases physical death. And uh, he came at just the right time and saved us. And all of this is evidence of his God's uh, uh, evidence of God's love for us and the fact that he was watching us so closely. And then he gives us his Holy Spirit upon faith. It says in that same passage, scarcely for a righteous man would somebody die. Uh, but perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. What's being said there is uh, when Paul writes to the Romans there and says, scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Uh, the idea there is that it's nearly impossible to find somebody who would actually give their life for a stranger, even if that stranger was innocent. Uh, if you knew that there was an innocent man right now on death row, uh, I can't imagine any one of us would be quick to sign up to change, uh, swap places with them. So maybe somebody would, but Paul is acknowledging the fact that that is scarce. Uh, scarcely for a righteous man would somebody die. He follows up with the idea that yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. So what the idea behind that is, even if they weren't a stranger and they were personally known, and that person had been of some benefit to you, even then it would be rare. And so his idea here is that what God has done for us to demonstrate his love is beyond what you would never find that in the human race, what God has done for us. He says, and then to counter what he just said there about uh, dying for a righteous man, he says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we were neither innocent nor beneficial to God. We were sinful. That means just absolutely worthless, uh, of no value. We added nothing to God. Uh, we were even his enemies at that time. So we were the opposite of uh, that character profile that would um, perhaps on a rare occasion justify somebody trading places with them and dying in their stead. But uh, we weren't anything close to that. We were still sinners, and that's when Christ died for us. So God's love, um, the love that he has for you, is hard to explain. And Paul is grasping for words here. He's putting together a, a bit of an idea to help us understand it, but I think even still for some of us it's difficult. Um, but please don't try to get an a handle on God's love by looking in the mirror. In other words, if you think that you have anything to do with God's loving you, uh, you've got it entirely wrong. 
So if you think that his love is somehow conditioned or influenced by, uh, predicated upon your performance or anything about you at all, you're wrong because um, he chose to love you while you were at your worst. I, I've often said about that passage to paraphrase that God's love was best seen uh, at a moment when he gave his best uh, to save you at your worst. And so that being true, God's love for you has nothing to do uh, with you. Uh, he doesn't love you uh, because of who you are. He loves us because of who he is. So you don't have anything to do with why or how much God loves you. If we, um, and I know it's tempting sometimes to believe that it does play into the whole scenario and um, the way I behave or the rate at which I mature as a Christian or the amount that I sacrifice for him uh, or any other thing. It's really tempting to believe that those things um, either help him to like me or if I fail, cause him to not love me as much and, and that his love sort of fluctuates based on uh, my day. <laughs> but that's not true. Uh, to fall to that temptation and to believe that God gives his love to you when or because you're lovable, um, that only makes real love impossible to see. You, you have to allow the Bible to color and interpret love for you. And it's alien. It's uh, Love like this isn't found on this planet. So you have to uh, get your definition of love from a whole nother world, the heavenly realm. God has to reteach love uh, to fallen creatures who misinterpret love all the time. And if we allow ourselves to start making an association between God's love for you and your good behavior toward him, all that's going to happen is that you'll distort the reality of what real love is. So always remember that real love, love that God offers to us, cannot be earned. Love cannot be earned. Not any more than salvation can. Love can't be earned, and since it's coming from God, who is love, and who has decided that you would be the object of his affection, love can't be lost. Uh, love doesn't go away just because we have... Uh, you know, because we're sinners. <laughs> we actually were loved when we were sinners, and so I don't think that we can lose it because we're sinners. Um, Paul goes on with that idea, and he says, much more than, so now there's more to this. He's building upon this idea that God's love is final, uh, uninfluenced, it is not determined by you and I, it's found in Christ and not you and me. Uh, but building on that, as if it could get any better, he says, much more than having now been justified by Christ's blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We have been justified by his blood, by his blood. And justification, uh, for those of you uh, who aren't familiar with the term, uh, simply means to be provided with right standing before God. So you imagine going before a judge in a court of law. Justification is to be given a clean slate before you even walk into the courtroom so that the judge sees you as if there was no crime committed, you have an absolutely clean record, and it's as if there was no charges to stick to your file. There's nothing on you. And so when we're justified by his blood, then we, we know that our standing before God, our position before the Lord, our justification, has nothing to do with us. Nothing to do with us. We can't justify ourselves, yet we always try, don't we? We always try to, um, you know, put on our best performance. We try to do our best for the Lord. Uh, and when we fail, we... Uh, really disappoint ourselves, but I can't imagine that God is as disappointed in us as some of us are in ourselves. Yet, because we're disappointed in ourselves for having failed, we forget that he loves us, we forget that Jesus' blood has justified us, and we project our own disappointment onto him as if he's disappointed in us too. 
our sin can affect the quality of the relationship that we have, but his love doesn't deplete because we have sinned. Again, he loved you at his best when you were at your worst, so there's nothing that you can do to negate his love. Nothing! And so God loves us. Our justification comes from the, ju the sacrifice that his son provided for us. So we can't do anything to help him on that. No one, none of us, not even the best of us, can justify ourselves like Jesus can. Now that's a great relief for those of us who tend to burden ourselves with a performance-oriented Christian faith. And that isn't faith at all. Uh, faith in yourself, maybe, but certainly not faith in Christ. And so we are invited to reject that frame of mind altogether. That entire line of reasoning that says that God's affected by how I live in terms of his love for me doesn't apply at all. His love for Christ is consistent. His love, love for Christ is never ending. And Jesus gave us his own standing. And so God sees us in that way. Now, if our confidence is at all in who we are or in what we can do to be loved by God, then our confidence is going to be very unstable. You're going to be living a very unstable Christian life. Uh, our salvation or our justification won't, but our confidence will. Okay, You're not going to be unsaved. Jesus isn't going to revoke his justification. So there's that's not unstable. That's rock solid. But your confidence in your salvation will be. If you let yourself believe that God's uh, attitude towards you is based upon your daily performance, then your confidence in your salvation, your confidence in Christ's blood to pay for your sin and to justify you before God, Christ's ability to shield you from God's wrath, and by the way, if Christ's sacrifice can shield you from God's wrath, which if you read the Bible, his wrath is very intense. Less intense than that is his disappointment. So if Jesus' sacrifice can shield, shield you from God's wrath, then do you suppose that it could possibly shield you from his disappointment? I mean, which one is worse? And if the, if the shield is thick enough to save you from one, don't you think it would be thick enough to save you from all of it? So, so if it saves you from God's wrath, it also saves you from his anger. It also saves you from disappointment. It saves you from everything. The only thing that can get through the shield of Christ's blood sacrifice is God's love. And that's what makes it through. You're loved by God. So it's a waste of time to try and be loved by God. You don't need to try. Jesus tried real hard when he was here. It worked. We're good. Beyond that, it says... For if we, if when we were enemies, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more than having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So since what we've already read in this passage is true, since while we were at our worst, God gave us his best as an offering of his love, if that's true, then we can be even more confident of his love right now. If he was able to love us while we were at our worst, then why would he not love us even now? Certainly we're not, as children of God, living our worst days today. Our worst days are behind us before we ever knew him. The Bible says we were walking in darkness, we were uh, children of wrath, we were um, abiding under the anger of God, our every thought and motive and action and word was corrupt, and we were altogether displeasing, and his anger was on us continually. And uh, those days are gone. We've been forgiven in Christ, we are being sanctified, uh, we strive with all of the power of the Holy Spirit within us to live a righteous life. Though we do fail, um, we aren't failing perhaps as often or as uh, dramatically, and so we are being sanctified. Uh, certainly, if Christ was, if God was able to love us uh, when we made no effort whatsoever, but were actually His enemies, 
then why would we not believe that he can love us right now in the present? Since he was able to love us in the beginning when we were sinners, we can be even more confident of his love for us in the present. Yet, that seldom seems to be the case, at least with some people. Uh, we think oftentimes that we need to walk on pins and needles and that God's love is still based on our performance somehow, which isn't true. We start to let ourselves believe that the only way to keep his love then is to be excellent, to live uh, maybe not a perfect life, but as close to perfect as we possibly can, which I can tell you will not make you happy. You will not be a happy Christian if that's the kind of life that you're living because it puts too much pressure on you. It's impossible. You're never going to, and you know that you won't. You know that you don't. And so then the only thing we can really do is to compensate for it by trying to be better than everybody else. And now we're not loving anybody else. So we're not loving God any longer. We're not loving anybody around us. Um, I guess our best bet then would be to sort of try and deceive ourselves into believing that we're actually living a good life when we're not. It's just pretend. And so the best thing that we can do is to come before the Lord and admit to him that we're weak, that we're not as uh, mature as we wish we were, but then pray to him for the grace and the help that we need in order to continue growing, knowing that we won't, we won't be perfect tomorrow, but trusting that he won't quit loving us in spite of it. And so we know that that's true of God. He felt very strongly toward you and I while we were still sinners. And if he felt this way about us when we were sinners, then why would he feel differently about us now that we're actually his kids? Uh, that would not be a righteous thing for God as a father to love his kids less after the adoption papers had been signed than he did before he ever went to the orphanage to pick them up. Now, God's not like that. It's not the kind of a father that he is. He loves his children. If anything, and I don't know if it's even possible, but if anything, the opposite would be true. It's not that he loves us less today. It's that his love for us is increasing. Again, I don't know if it's possible. Maybe he loved us with the fullness of his love in the beginning. Um, but I believe that it's more possible that his love for us is growing than that it's shrinking. I think it's true sometimes that the way the way God feels about you can oftentimes be the opposite of the way you feel about yourself. That's why we need to start understanding from God's perspective how this works. Because if we base our relationship with God on how we feel, we're going to be all over the map. And that won't make for a healthy and vibrant Christian witness. It won't make for a fruitful life. And it will be slow growing and very difficult for you and I in this life if we misunderstand God's love. The last line in that passage, he says, not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've received the reconciliation. We rejoice in God. He says, not only all this, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've receive the reconciliation. So to have a clear understanding of God's love for you is going to change the dynamic of the relationship that you have with him. And that's the goal. God's love for you isn't going to change, but your love for him is meant to grow and increase. God would ideally have it that you rejoice in him. Like we all know that we're supposed to fear God, but God doesn't want that to be the sum total of your relationship with him. Not at all. I want my own children to respect me and to have a certain amount of fear for me, reverence for me. I want them to listen. When I say something, I, I want them to uh, take heed. However, <clears throat> that's not what I want the, the whole color of our relationship to be. I want it to be love. And this is what God hopes for us. So to receive an understanding of his love, 
causes us to rejoice in him. That's how this is to work. If we can understand God's love for us and to embrace his love for us, then the result of that will be to rejoice in God. We rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We rejoice in God. The one, the same one, the same God, who, when we were sinners, we feared or we were indifferent toward or we were distant from. It's that same God that now, having been loved by him, we rejoice in. So knowing God's love for us is going to improve the relationship that we have with him. This is why he recorded what he did in Romans and elsewhere. This is why he gave us a Bible that from cover to cover explains to us and reveals the breadth of God's love that he has toward us. And so, as John says in 1 John chapter 4, we are then inspired to love him in return. So take a look at your relationship with God. If it is one that seems rather loveless and you're struggling to really be close to him um, and regard him as a dad, and yourself as a son or daughter, uh, maybe you need to take a closer look at some of these passages that do speak specifically of God's love for you. Not for the world, not for the human race, but for you as an individual. Um, I pray tonight that God will show you how much you're loved and that understanding his love for you will result in a greater understanding of uh, all that Christ has done, that you might love him in return. So, Until next week, guys, um, I hope you tune in on Sunday and we'll continue through the book of Revelation. Um, I hope we can gather together soon. Um, until then, uh, be prayerful for the church and for me and for each other. God bless you guys. Good night.